Okay, welcome everybody, 688. Tonight we're going to start and we're going to take our sweet time with this because module three is the uh, center, to use a crude analogy, the meat of this whole course. And so the question is, so how come? Well, understanding by design, which was created by two gentlemen by the name of Grant Wiggins and Jay McTeague, I think, I think, really crystallize the whole idea about curriculum design. And, uh, and they get some pushback from people because they say it's just a bunch of cliches that they throw out. I don't think they're cliches. I think they make perfect sense. Let's take up cliche number one. You can't start a journey unless you know where you're going. So here's the thing. Have you ever gone on a trip and you knew you were going to go and hang out at the beach? And then when you got to the beach, all of a sudden you realized you hadn't packed the sunscreen, you hadn't packed the beach umbrella, you hadn't packed. And so what Wiggins and McTighe would say, you knew you were going to the beach. That's your, that's your goal. So all the other stuff then is stuff you should have done before you got to the beach. And so what they argue is they do not see curriculum design, lesson plan design as being linear. And you'll hear me say this over and over again when we get to the actual filling out the uh, lesson plan template. They don't see it as being linear. Here's what they see and I'm reading from the screen here, so forgive me. But I think it is, this is the other uh, cliche they use that people push back on, but I think it makes perfect sense. The goal of UBD, I would argue the goal of education, forget UBD, the goal of education is student understanding that kids have the ability to make meaning of the ideas that they're being taught and then transfer that learning. The whole point of education is students understanding through demonstrations of their understanding of the ideas, the topics being taught, and then transfer them, transfer that demonstrates that real learning has gone on. Now, if you take a second, think about that. What do we do now? And we're, that's what we're doing tonight is we're looking at those three different ways of looking at teaching. The, the way we do teaching mostly is we just talk, kids take a test, they get a grade back, we move on. Now, under the UBD banner, actually, again, I keep, okay, I'll, I'll give it. The UBD banner, what they're saying is students get the big ideas, and there's lots of ways of getting the big idea. They then de do demonstrations of the understanding of the big ideas and then transfer. So see, when we, when we do it normally, we stop at that point where the kids do the big ideas, do their demonstrations and big ideas. Because a test can be a demonstration of, the, of your understanding. No two ways about it. But then are you transferring it? You know, one of the things that when I was working with a group of kids over here at No Middle School, and I was working with the algebra teacher over there, and we were doing quadratics. And so one of the things we did with quadratics, working with the kids, and we were in a very, uh, very early, early uh, online um, social media kind of program that was a closed network. The kids could only write and, and write about each other's work within the network. It wasn't like you could go home and, well, actually, later on, <laughs> um, we developed it so you could log in from other locations. But anyway, the point of the whole thing was, the teacher basically taught them the equation of a quadratic and how it then can be used. So you had that. And then kids did demonstrations of understanding by solving different quadratic equations. Next step. The next step was she put them into groups and they were then to develop what a fountain for the school and she even, you know, the place for the fountain was right out and still right out in front of no. 
And so they were then to develop the fountain. So they had to go find the information. What kind of pump would be neat? How far would the pump pump the water? And then what would be the area under curve? Hello, quadratic. What would be the area under curve of our pump? So we would be able to fit it within the size of the fountain. And so we, I was over there one day with her um, and Stephanie was talking to the kids and, and they had to do something that we called stand and defend. So what they would do is they would get up and uh, we had her computer connected to get this, an LCD pad that sat on top of an overhead projector. And then they would get up and run uh, the, her computer. They would bring up their plans, their arguments, their discussion notes and everything back and forth. And they would do a stand and defend. Here's what we think. Here's what we, we are doing. And when we applied the quadratic formula for it, this is how we ended up. We figured out it would take this much space. And one of the kids at the end, when we were kind of debriefing, how did it go? How do you feel about all this? Said, you know what? Quadratics are real. And I just looked at her and we looked at each other and we did a high five because that's the whole point. She had gone through a professional development training that I did with a dear friend of mine by the name of Bill DeSanctis. And one of the things that we talked a lot about in this training, even though it was technology about, in other words, using this new system we had called uh, Knowledge Form for kids to develop ideas together, working collectively and collaboratively on computers, it really was about understanding by design. And that's how I got to go and sit in and actually be trained by, by Grant. Uh, Grant's no longer with us, which I think is a real loss for uh, curriculum. And uh, Jay's still with us. But I always, I always kind of felt like Jay was the guy who did the detail work. And Grant was the guy who had the big ideas. And you'll see. Uh, I'm going to play a couple of videos actually into the recording. I think I've got my speakers and everything set up right. If it turns out to be really bad, you know, feel free to stop and jump into the recordings, uh, you know, in the module yourself. Um, this is one of the things that drives me nuts, maybe nuttier, is the fact that I can't get Collaborate Ultra to sync up with, um, you know, the sound that you can play through YouTube or whatever on your computer. You know, I, I just want to get on the phone and, and call them up and scream at them and go, you know, there's a there's a product out there called Soundflower, which is free. All you got to do is incorporate it into your stupid program. And then we could record the live um, sound that comes off of videos. Instead, I'm sitting here with my, you all know the microphone I've got sitting here in front of me. And I've got two old Apple concert speakers that I've got set up here. These speakers are, well, let's just say they go back a ways and they, and they're heavy, man, they're heavy, but they still will fill a room with sound. Now I'm not going to fill the room with sound obviously, but I'm hoping that the quality of sound that comes out of them and the quality of my microphone, they'll pick it up and it'll sound. Okay. Let's get back to understanding by design. All education, is about students' demonstrations of understanding of the big ideas and then transferring that knowledge. Teachers are coaches of that understanding, not mere purveyors of content or activities. They design for and support, they design for meaning making and transfer. They design for meaning making and transfer, as well as purveyors of the content. I am not the final word of content. There's no one of us in the room any smarter than all of us in the room. It is one of the things that I think is so hard for us to let go of. Now, no one is saying that the teacher goes and sits in a corner and throws the books out. Oh, the other cliche they throw out, and you'll hear Grant say this in a minute. Textbook is not the curriculum. The textbook is not the curriculum. The whole point of textbooks is that they are resources. And then those resources should spring kids into realizing that there's more than just a textbook. Let's find other 
resources that are to you, as I'm going to show you in a minute. One of the things that I find that people have the hardest time understanding about understanding by design is when you get to the lesson plan. And I think the, it's because people are so used to when they're working in side curricular kinds of things that there is this sort of set procedure, step one, step two, step three, step four. In fact, I, I found when I was setting this class up years ago, there's lots of, uh, and I would call them um, home office experts, you know, the people who sit in central office who are supposedly the curriculum experts and they'll create a video that they post on YouTube and they go, step number one, do this. And then everybody is supposed to do that. And then you'll be a, a good teacher. Grant makes it very clear that when you approach the understanding by design lesson plan, you are not starting at a certain point and ending up at a certain point. You are basically looking at it in a holistic way of how do all the disparate pieces hold together for that final piece. So when you look at this graphic I have got up on the screen right now, this is the UBD in a nutshell graphic. I have used this, I can't tell you how many years. Well, how many years ago was it I learned about understanding by design? We'll call it <clears throat> 25 and uh, we'll leave it at that, okay? But transfer goals and content goals, what will we be doing? Now, I think this is backwards. It should be what content goals and transfer goals will be, but I'm okay with that. And that's part of that. That's part of my problem of linear thinking. I, I kind of want to say, okay, but now we've done this piece. We'll go to this piece. They wouldn't like that. <laughs> what should students come away with understanding? In other words, if you walk in the room and you sit with kids and when they're finished, the kid's going to turn to you and look at you and go, you know, quadratics are real. Bam. That's the kind of thing that you expect kids to do. To put this into Mark's world, you would expect a kid when he you get done, and I'm thinking small children here, to look at you and go, wow, the solar system is a really, really big place. And then to give you a description of what do you mean by a really, really big space. When I was teaching science to, um, and when I, I was a special ed teacher, but what I did was because I had a science background is I would co-teach with the fifth grade teachers, the science and, you know, fifth grade science back then, it's pretty reflective of what they do now. You know, we did earth and solar system and we did, um, Newton's laws, things like that. Um, but we built a real scale version of the solar system. It was hilarious. It was hilarious. And we did it that classic one you see in all of the textbooks where the sun is on the left and then the planets kind of move out to the right. Of course, we know, you know the planets are in elliptical orbits and all of that. But what I wanted to do was just give kids a sense of scale. And not only scale in terms of the size of the sun versus the planets, but of course, scale in terms of the distance. Well, Pluto, because we can still consider Pluto part of the solar system back then, Pluto left the school property. <laughs> and it ended up, and what we would do is we had these different size balls. Of course, you can imagine we had to have a very large, large ball that was the sun. Um, I think it was a like a giant, not a beach ball like you throw around at a at a game. It was a very large beach ball. I think it had a diameter of like uh, four to five feet. So that helped us with scale a little bit. But Pluto ended up being out of the schoolyard. Um, da, 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 maybe maybe a quarter of a mile away. And the kids were just stunned. Mainly because, and, and I forget, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember, it was a million miles, was, um, I forget what it was. But you could imagine 
looking at that proximity of Mercury, Earth, and Mars, Earth, excuse me, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and then boom. <laughs> and it was one of those moments where, like I said, they all came back into the classroom. We all sat around and said, yeah, solar system, big place. So those are the kinds of things that we want kids to be able to do. Where I'm sorry, I can't see your comment. Let me jump down here and see it. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. And that's the kind of stuff and that's the kind of stuff we want kids to do because we want them to understand it's a big place. Well, yeah, but if you could actually get a sense of how big is big, then you you really do get a sense. Here's the third one coming down here under desired results. This is the one that teachers literally struggle with, and it makes me so angry because what will happen is central office will basically come up with these questions and just tell teachers, well, here's the question. That's not fair. It's not fair for teacher growth. It's not fair for student exploration. So essential questions have always been the bugaboo, have always been the hardest thing for teachers to get their heads around. I've always maintained that it's something that kids should be a part of too. And then finally, that what knowledge and skill will the kids leave with? Then we look at the assessment evidence. Okay, so we get into trouble with this because people want to think about that in terms of test. That's where facets of understanding come in. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sit on this one for very long because we'll do facets of understanding next week. And then we'll do the um, the actual filling out of the UBD template the week after that. When we think about the plan. Planning is best done, as they call it, backwards. They get a lot of pushback on that, too. Because if this is what I want to know, kids understand scale and understand that the solar system is a very, very large place. And that's why, even when we think about traveling from the Earth to the moon, it still takes three days. What, what is it that is the X in that equation? Well, of course, we know it's speed. And so when we see movies, TV shows, where the Star Trek Enterprise goes from planet to planet within a frame to another frame, and Captain Kirk is sitting there in the chair, or Captain Picard, or I don't even watch the newest one, and he says, warp factor three, what does that mean? Now, when we did that over at No, again, with Stephanie, my first love of math teachers, <laughs> we realized that trying to get kids to understand distances, light speed, all of that, was a mathematical formula, obviously. But really what it was, was a conceptual thing. So when someone says warp factor three, and when we look at the TV show, when Captain whoever says we arrived at planet such and such, and we understand the length of time it was, then warp factor three was really darn fast. And what was fascinating was there was a group of, and I'm proud to say this, boys and girls at No, who sat down and, and started a whole thing because um, Star Trek had just come back. In other words, it, it, you know, TV show had been canceled and TV movie and the movies came back. So these are the movies, not the next one, not Star Trek uh, Next Generation. But they were all trying to figure out how would you build something that would power a starship and what was fascinating was at the time uh, I had a friend who taught physics over here on campus and I put him into the same discussion group 
So they had an expert. And they had the greatest discussion about, of course, what were the limitations of light speed, relativity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it was one of the greatest, greatest examples of backward design that I've ever seen. We have to understand that when we design, we have to understand what are our desired results and the transfer task. Again, what I said at the very beginning, desired results usually equate to everybody made 80% or higher on the test. It never then takes the next step and says, and they were able to build, they were able to demonstrate, they were able to help you understand what it must have been like, so on, so on, which is the, which is the facets of understanding piece. Your three goals, your three stages, which are goals, assessment, learning activities, must all align for the plan. In other words, they are always taking me to where I want to end up. Content standards no longer become the end point. Boy, say that in a room somewhere and you'll get the looks. Content standards no longer become the end point. They are the starting point for the big ideas and the transfer task. I watched a young teacher over at Wagner last year, physics, and she was doing Newton. And so the challenge was she gave each kid in the room. In fact, she came and raided my office and I have a, you know, all nerds have a junk box. Can we all just agree to that? We all have junk boxes. So she came in and raided my junk box. Um, and she took it back. She also raided my Lego junk box too. And she took it back and she, she gave each group in this class one of the junk boxes. Now each box contained the same stuff. They had to build a vehicle that would transverse up to the top of a uh, paper mache mountain. The paper mache mountain was at its base at about eight feet wide. At its top, it was about five feet wide. It had sort of um, a kind of, it wasn't straight sides. They, you, could, you could see how you could manipulate a, a vehicle to drive up the thing. And she asked me to come in just to kind of sit and watch. So there was a group that sat all by themselves and they didn't interact very much with anybody. In fact, they didn't interact with each other very much. And I went over and I sat with them and I just started pulling things out of the box. Whether, and I didn't say anything <laughs> and they didn't say anything. They just kind of looked at me out of the corner of their eyes. And she had these big giant rubber bands. Now, anybody who's ever played with potential and kinetic energy, your light bulb just went off. So I'm sitting there with this, this big giant rubber band, a thick thing too. And she had all kinds of rubber bands. And to her credit, to her credit, everybody had the same stuff. So they all had five of the kind of, you know, small rubber bands all the way up to the, the big bazooka guys. And so we're sitting there and the other things that were in the box, there were things that could be used as wheels because she stole them from me. Uh, there were things, <laughs> there were sticks, there were, you know, all kinds of stuff. There was tape, there was glue. And so we were sitting there and so I was taking the urban, I was just literally sitting there stretching it back and forth. And this one kid, looked at me and you could tell he was that nerdy smart aleck kid and he said you're trying to get us to look at that rubber band aren't you and i said no not really i said i'm just the kind of guy that has to be doing something all the time i said and this i like this rubber band 
And then the young lady was sitting to my left, who was wearing her scarf. She looked at me and she said, so are you trying to say we should be thinking about kinetic and potential energy? I'm just doing the rubber band. And I said, well, what would you think about kinetic and potential energy with this? Then the kid who was sitting, who was sitting to my right, who needs to take a shower, he chimed in and he said, well, I mean, we could be thinking about it as a, as the way you would do it, where you would roll the rubber band up and then let it go. And it would release the, uh, potential energy into kinetic energy and we could put wheels on it and we could just try to drive it up the mountain. He said, but looking over there at that mountain, it's going to take an awful lot of energy to get up that mountain. I'm just kind of sitting there doing this with the rubber band. And then they all hit upon the same idea. Literally at the same time, let's build a helicopter. <laughs> and I just smiled and got up and walked away. It is one of those things where the teacher had helped them understand potential kinetic energy and the connection between the two, obviously. And she had helped them understand how to calculate that. It's high school, by the way, physics. And all they wanted was somebody to just sit there and take a rubber band out. And then they would start talking. And I left. And when I came back, darn if they hadn't built a helicopter. So you see, we, we have to realize that we can take, we can take curriculum that is force fed to us <laughs> either through a textbook or God help you curriculum maps. We can take that and we can then look at it and realize what big ideas here. And my big ideas that are, that are related to that, when I get over to the ways of I'm going to do the learning activities and the assessments, they're going to be different. Now, I don't think it's too big a jump for me to say technology fits in here. Well, really? Really, Steve? Yeah. Facets of understanding, it runs through it everywhere. We have to realize that TPAC taught us that technology does not come front first, unless you're teaching a technology class, unless you're teaching Photoshop. Technology is always a tool that allows for continuous improvement. It can allow for continuous improvement. It is not the tool to use for continuous improvement. Continuous improvement is a way of looking at your design and taking all those results from assessment, the quality of student work, how engaged were the kids? And then looking back and realizing that the technology worked well or it didn't work well. And I would argue that it should work in terms of the way TPAC looks at it, that it supports the pedagogy that the kids or the teacher is employing, or the kids might be employing. You know, teachers don't employ collaborative learning. They allow for collaborative learning, but the kids are the ones who are doing it. So it is, the key to this is we have to realize that what understanding by design is trying to do is to get us to say, where are we going? Where are we going? And also to believe truly believe that all education is about understanding through demonstrations of understanding transfers and activities that demonstrate that transfer. Now, I'm going to go into the module here. Oh, here's the book. 
I looked it up on Amazon before I sat down here today. Uh, the book is is really not that bad anymore. Boy, when they first came out, that first edition is expensive. But now it's it's down into the 20s of dollars, and you can actually buy an understanding by design. In fact, I'm sitting here holding it. The Understanding by Design Professional Development Workbook. That is, let's see how many pages, 295 pages. Would you have shot me if I made you go out and buy this? Yes, you would. So I kind of find it, I find it kind of funny that the guys, you know, talk all the time about the, the textbook is not the curriculum unless it's theirs. <laughs> um, but in here, this is not the full book. Okay. This is what the Google folks uh, allow us to have. But what I did is in here, you will find the uh, facets by under, facets, the five facets of understanding. I can talk the six facets. <laughs> Gosh, the six facets of understanding. I'm sorry. I was teaching something yesterday. It had a five in it. The six facets of understanding. So this is in the book, and we'll we'll get to that next week. And the other chapter you're being asked to read. But what I want to do tonight is I want you to hear these guys. So I'm going to jump into UBD understanding. There's the man. That's Grant Wiggins. Uh, one of the best presenters that I've ever had the uh, privilege of sitting in a room with. So I'm going to let him take over now. Um, he is about 10 minutes long. So if you're having trouble hearing it or if it's blasting you, just stop this and go listen to him on your own. UBD is not a philosophy of teaching. It's not an approach to teaching. It's a planning framework. And it's really important to keep this in mind, that what you're trying to do is make it more likely by design that when you teach, you're more goal-focused, more effective. You could be a bad teacher with a good plan. In other words, we're not saying that a good plan makes you a better teacher necessarily. You have to learn pedagogical moves. You have to learn to be facile and skilled with how to pay attention to group dynamics. UBD doesn't help you with that, but it does prepare you to think short term, long term. What are we trying to accomplish? And it's like the famous line from Pasteur, chance favors the prepared mind. You're totally prepared for teachable moments, not in the sense of, oh, well, that's a cool student comment. Let's just run with that for five days. That's not serendipity. That's letting the, teach, the students write the curriculum. And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being so prepared about where you want to end up that you hear a potential student comment as a fantastic entry point to go where you want to end up. In other words, it's your job to know where we want to end up. I don't think we make any apologies about that. But part of where we want to end up is building autonomous, proactive, thoughtful people not just march through some stuff, causing some typical learning. So we're trying to keep long-term goals in view. We're trying to get the blend of content and performance right. Notice I didn't say process, content and performance. Because that's the ultimate goal. The student performs as in the soccer situation, on their own, effectively, fluently, drawing from their repertoire. And this also tends to better engage people, as I think you already know. What we see over and over again is that there's a misalignment between short-term plans and actions and long-term goals. Here's a simple example. We value something called critical and creative thinking. It's in every program's goal statement. It's in many school mission statements. It's clearly something we care about. But it is possible to get straight A's at every school in America without critical and creative thinking. As long as you're smart, compliant, do your work, are thorough, you're going to get straight A's in almost every school in America. I'm jumping in here because I have a story. And also because uh, the sound's not coming out of my speakers, it's coming out of the computer. And I don't know if you all are able to hear it very well. Hey, Mark, can you hear the sound? 
Oh, good. All right. Is it real echoey? I mean, can you can you hear him clearly? All right. Let me go back then to my story. To Grant's point, I have a dear friend of mine, a brother from another mother, who has some of the most remarkable children I've ever met. Um, and they run the gambit from a daughter who was a national merit finalist, got a full ride to center, ended up working for uh, Goldman Sachs, was able to retire, was able to retire at 28 years old, came home, bought her own house because she made that much money. Uh, and then she's looking around trying to figure out what to do with herself now. And another daughter that was a remarkable we just lost the sound for a second. Now I'm gonna make sure we're back. Okay, I lost the sound for a second. Can you hear me, Mark? I hate when that happens. The, the cord that connects to my microphone literally fell out. One, two, three, there it goes. All right, we're back. Sorry about that. So he has this child who is smarter and smart, goes off, makes some money. Second child is a, is an athlete. She got a full ride because she um, excelled in field hockey. I think she went to Virginia Tech. I'm not quite sure. The third child is a artist. And her medium, <laughs> her medium is concrete. Now, concrete, not in the sense of the kind of thick, heavy stuff we use to build things with, but the light, fluffy stuff. If you've ever been around concrete. His last child is a young man with Down syndrome. And one of the things that I, I'm very close to, to the son, um, and I played a little bit, a little part of getting him a shot and he was uh, picked to be in a movie. And he is now a full blown member of uh, Screen Actors Guild. And he has an agent in Hollywood. And he travels all over the country doing speeches, et cetera, et cetera. So we were sitting around at my friend's house one day, all four of these kids in the room. And we, I, I asked, I said, you know, it's amazing to me that all this talent is in the room. And his his sister, the one who worked for Goldman Sachs, she goes, you know, all I had to do in school, just sit there and be quiet, make A's on my test, and do what the teacher told me to do. And I got a free ride to center. And then when I got a job at Goldman Sachs, I realized how little I knew. And by the way, that job she got, she moved to New York City. They had no clue about how to survive in a big city. She then said, looking at David, she said, David is the smartest one in the room because every single day of his life, David had to learn something new and incorporate that into a lifetime of learning and living. This is one of the most remarkable statements I've ever heard. And I think it flips the whole idea about learning to Grant's point here, that we're not just sitting there. We shouldn't be just sitting there taking in, regurgitating back, pass the test, move on through. And then when we finally get to college, and the first thing we always tell college freshmen is nobody cares. Nobody cares if you come to class. Nobody cares if you get up early in the morning to come to class. 
And so again, we just keep devaluing education. If we get to the point where we're saying to people, let me show you, let's go on this journey and let me show you how what we now have learned applies. Okay, I'll show up. We'll go back to Grant. So very basic backward design premise then. If critical and creative thinking is the goal long term, using content critically and creatively, this is a different way, then when we go to plan, we have to make sure week in and week out that we're focusing on critical and creative use of content. Otherwise, we're not going to get it. And this is, I think, the fatal mistake of prep schools. They think because we're smart, because we're motivated, because we hire really intelligent, well-educated people, that this is just going to happen. Sobering story, but it's a true story. Well-known prep school in the top 10 or 20 of prep schools in the country. They say, we're, we're, we're really interested in this pedagogical effectiveness stuff. And the guy in question is a, a really fantastic educator who's done a lot of work in the wider world. And so he's really interested in the question of value added at this school. So they contract with ETS, pre-assess ninth grade, assess 12th grade, critical thinking test. No gain. <laughs> no gain. We admit them smart, we graduate them smart, we pat ourselves on the back, and we start teaching all over again. The value added thing is huge. You can't just pat yourself on the back because you admit smart people and they do good things. You guys have a higher calling than that. So we want to focus on these long term goals and we want to. Do you see where I drank the lemonade? The Kool Aid? That guy. Okay. So uh, I don't have anything to add. Let's just keep watching. To embed them in our short term plans. And the more you start to think this way, the more you'll realize you're not doing it. Again, I saw this on the soccer field. I saw that we were not developing any strategic thinking. One day I was in a scrimmage. And I'm, I'm looking at the scrimmage, you know, I'm there in the middle of the field reffing it. I'm watching people and I'm saying, there's a lot of aimless running around here. <laughs> so the ball's over here. What are you doing and why are you doing it? I don't know. I don't know. So I said, all right, new rule. We're going to do freeze tag. If I don't like your answer, the ball goes over the other side. I'm always going to ask somebody on offense. And for like two weeks, there was no good answer. And of course, I realized that's my fault. There's no strategic thinking. My daughter's an elite soccer player. She's a senior at the George School. She's in North Carolina in a tournament right now. She doesn't have a good strategic thinking because she's had all these elite coaches that tell you what to do all the time. She had a coach, though, who doesn't coach at the George School anymore. He's a retired Princeton coach who did it for a dollar a year, one of those great gigs. He did the coolest thing at halftime. So, you know, they get in the circle that you always do at halftime. So, he said, what's working? What's working for us? Again, same thing. For a couple of weeks, they couldn't answer. Uh, we're winning. Yeah, I know that. What's working on the field? What's not working for us? What do we need to work on in the second half? In other words, Socratic questions was all he did at halftime. But the coolest question is, what's working for them? Mm -hmm. What do we have to stop? She was a different player. So were her teammates. So there's this tendency in even really good programs in schools to not help kids gain proactive control of the situation and have a long-term view. Simple test, you're, you, all of you are teaching now. Ask kids to self-assess right now, now's a good time, January, against your goals for the year. Oh, what, a, what, a, what is her goal for the year? <laughs> I mean, that's what's gonna happen. And they're gonna cherry pick some random little things and you're gonna be depressed, but that's a good experience. <laughs> that's a really good experience. It's the kid who has to meet the goals. It's that's called a, 
Ipsative Assessment, I-P-S-A-T-I-V-E, Ipsative Assessment. You use it every single day. Trying to lose weight. I get on the scale. Let's see what I weigh today. I'm trying to gain strength through exercise. I'm trying to read good books. Ipsative Assessment. We don't do it with kids. So what are you trying to learn here? What do you know? Where are we? Back to Grant. Boy, you can really tell I drank his Kool-Aid, can't you? It's the kid that has to understand via transparency and reinforcement the long-term goals. So critical and creative thinking, to go back to our example, is a goal. Then that should be so obvious that the kids will self-assess against critical and creative thinking. Let's try it as a quick and dirty exercise. Think pair share. If you had to write a one sentence mission statement for your course, what would it be? Jot some thoughts, try it out on the person next to you. One sentence mission statement. What is the point of my course? And I'm using the word course to cover everything from pre-K to graduate school, from soccer to physics. If you are an elementary person, you can, you can think of course in either one of two ways. You could say, what's the point of what I do with first graders? Or what's the point of the language arts strand? Mm -hmm. Or the social studies strand? So you can go either way there, since you have so many duties. Let me ask you to pause for a minute. And let's do a little bit of backward design thinking. And then this is the basic logic of backward design. We'll say more about it later. And many of you know this. If that's the goal, what follows? If that's the long-term goal, what follows? What follows for assessment? What follows for instruction? Go back to your conversations and just together play out casually and informally at this point the answers to those questions as they occur to you. If that's the goal, what should we be assessing? And by assessing, I do not mean grading. I right. mean assessing. Right. Just like you would do as a soccer coach. You don't give a grade as a varsity. So, well, maybe in some schools you do. I never do. But you're assessing. You're, you're judging how we're doing against the goal. You're coaching. You're giving information about how we're doing against the goal. So what should we assess? And what should we be doing instructionally? Or what should occur in the classroom? And let me tell you one quick story before we do it. When I asked this question and a fourth grade teacher pulled me over and she said, well, I, I, there's two parts to my answer. I want students to be good readers, but more importantly, I want them to love to read. I said, let's just focus on the love to read. We know, you know, we know something about how to make good readers, but focus for me on love to read. What would be evidence that they love to read? And what do you have to do instructionally to make it more likely that they love to read? And I said, be careful. Requiring them to do everything isn't likely to cause it. In fact, it may undercut it. We know this about boys. So that's the caution. If that's your goal, what's the assessment? what needs to happen instructionally to support and head toward your goal. So somebody go first, do it together, then somebody go second, do it together. Five, 10 minutes. Every time I watch that video, and we're gonna watch another one here in just a second, I realize how much I miss this man. As I said, I sat in a room like that with him and went through the trainings and I drank his Kool-Aid. I hope you're getting a sense here of what he's trying to do. He's trying to get us to realize that we have to have the goal first. We have to identify what we're trying to do. Now, people who do curriculum for central office will tell you, well, we have those goals. They are this, they are that. The problem is, do we then do the backward design of what activities and what assessment we're going to use? And I also argue that assessment, and you'll hear Grant say this too, assessment 
doesn't have to be a graded test. Assessment should be a demonstration of understanding. Oh, also, do you notice how he tells stories too? <laughs> Let me give you another story. So I got invited to go watch um, the whole digital backpack thing. Boy, if there ever was a scam, there it is. Well, no, the guy who came in and went to Bellarmine for a while and said he had the answer for teaching reading. And all, all people had to do was to do his uh, stand on one foot, rub your tummy, and pat your head, and then everybody would become great readers. He's gone, by the way, now. He, he stole his money and, and got out of town. And JCPS was paying for T-Pill to go to Bellarmine to get that guy's training. All right. So I'm invited to sit in on the digital backpack. First kid gets up. Hi, I'm Sally. I, my scores on the NPA were this. My scores on the LPA were this. My goal is I realized that I need to do better on the MPA and the LPA. Um... How so? In other words, what part of the MPA, LPA did it inform you that you needed to do better on? I need to make better scores. So I'm already, you know, not at the kid, but it became obvious they've been coached. And they had a PowerPoint on the wall behind them. <laughs> and so the and and they aren't even running the PowerPoint. The kid isn't running a PowerPoint. There's someone else, there's a teacher, there's an adult who's running the PowerPoint. How hard is it to run a PowerPoint? What an incredible skill, life skill, as much as I hate PowerPoints. What an incredible life skill it would be to have a kid run a PowerPoint. We called that stand and defend. Stand and defend. Tell me what you did. Then they went on to tell us what they what they put into their digital backpack. How many of them were actually digital? Most of them were pictures of papers. And I mean worksheet papers. I couldn't stand it. So after about oh and then another kid comes in and she was obviously in the advanced program class. Why? Because she was very, very erudite. She could tell us all kinds of, I've been to Paris. And every once in a while, she'd drop a little bit of French. Going back to Grant's thing about the good kids at good schools. She knew the game. Then we got a kid that came in who we were told would have a support person with her, her special needs teacher, because she would have trouble reading it. Well, why would she have trouble reading it if she wrote it? I shut up. She gets up, here are my MPA scores, here are my LPA scores. I realize I'm really below in the MPA and the LPA, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Meanwhile, behind her, you know, things running. One of the pictures of her in her digital backpack presentation was a piece of artwork that was a fabric, it was a batik, if you know what batik is. And I just latched onto that because at the end they, they let us do, do you have questions for the candidate? <laughs> so I, I asked her, I said, talk to me about that batik you made. She lit up and she looked at me she says you know what batik is yeah i do i dated a girl that was uh, an art student here in louisville and then she was really into batik so we we had a conversation that went on for 30 minutes about her talking about the different techniques of batiking and why she picked the one that she picked and why she picked the particular one that she had in the digital backpack. She was very proud of her dashiki that she made. She leaves the room. And I go, there's your problem. 
this is all a sham. And of course, everybody got mad at me. It's all a sham until you allow kids to speak their passion and putting them into an eight slide doohickey, PowerPoint, whatever, slides, didn't matter. Could have been Google, could have been Microsoft, who cares? But yet none of it really reflected their passion. You never, never give them a chance to expound upon their passion. All right, let's go back and let's pick up where we kind of left off. is not the course. <laughs> Repeat after me. The textbook is not the course. The textbook is a resource in support of your goals. The textbook doesn't know your transfer goals and it frankly doesn't care about them. I worked for Pearson. I've worked on 11 textbooks now and it's endlessly interesting and endlessly frustrating because of what a textbook, well, what a textbook used to be until the Apple announcement. That's way cool. Way cool, great possibilities. Go watch the webinar if you haven't seen it, it's really cool. To say it a slightly different way, this is a conversation that every department should always have. Again, this follows from the logic of backward design. If these are our goals, what should we do with the resources? You wanna know how bad it is? At a good school math department, uh, I had a woman who freaked out over this exercise. She said, well, all the chapters are important. I mean, she couldn't, she couldn't get beyond that, that we have to go through all the chapters and all the chapters are important. I said, well, you do know, of course, this was in Michigan. I said, you do know, of course, that the textbook is written to be sold in three states. I mean, you know this, Florida, Texas, California. It's so bad. I was reviewing, as part of my contract with Pearson, I was reviewing a, a social studies book. I, I wish I remember the term. I should have written it down. Some term I never heard. I didn't know what the hell it was. I said, what is this? Taxes. <laughs> so here's a simple example to underscore the TMA logic. And this is in the, the design guide that you had excerpts from. But it's useful to to sort of realize that this is the kind of conversation that has to take place. So, uh, Chuck, what's your goal as a history teacher, US history teacher? Well, I want students to understand the Constitution and three branches of government. That's not a goal. That's the content with a pronoun in front of it. What we've been saying all morning is, what do you want them to be able to do with it? What meanings and transfer do you want? This is not a goal statement. And by the way, this is not a new idea. Ralph Tyler said this in 1938. He said it again in his book, The Principles of Curriculum Instruction, 1949. This is an old idea that you can't design backward from content headings. You have to design backward from the outcomes you want with the use of content. This has huge implications for how you use Atlas Rubicon. Most maps. Okay, let me stop again because I want to make sure you're, you're getting a sense here. So what he's saying to you is you must design from the final outcome what your content is going to be. That is where we can step in with technology. Okay, that's one of those places where you step in with technology. When we get to designing our lesson plan, the thing I want you to realize is, because you'll see there's a bunch of boxes, it doesn't have to be in every box. That takes us back to TPAC. That's TPAC talking to us. It doesn't have to be in every box. It can be a piece of the content. Use this YouTube video to then develop an understanding of what it is that we're learning about. Use Make Beliefs comics to create a, a social awareness comic about the topic in our social studies. You know, it's all over the place in how you plug it in. I love this, man. Stink, because they're written backward from content. They're not written back from performance goals. 
from understanding goals. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, I think I get it. So here's my meaning goal. Well, that has an interesting implication because I probably won't start in the distant past. I might go from the present to the past a fair amount in my teaching of US history. Just because the book starts with Columbus and the Puritans doesn't mean our course should start there. This would immediately be clear if you were clear on these meaning goals. We're beginning with where the students are, with the debate that's in the air. We're beginning from a position of strength because the students have some knowledge. You start with the Puritans. Who the hell knows anything about the Puritans and who cares? Transfer goals? Make sense? So let's have a, a, a... Okay, I would call him out on something here, and I, I lost it. He uh, let it get away from me. Let's go back and look at that slide where he was talking about examples. Goals from other activities or sports or experience, or they may not. Small group project, crucial. Okay, I, I'm, I'm screwing up the thing here. Let me get it back to where I want it to be. One of the things that, that I do worry about when I saw this, and I just saw it, okay, <laughs> was the idea of shallow constructivism versus constructivism thinking and constructivism learning. Um, shallow constructivism is like, well, one of his things there was build a government for Iraq. You can't do that. You're not a politician, you're not there in Iraq, but what we can do is we could say, what would a government that is for a destroyed country where the government doesn't exist anymore, what would it be like? And you could do that through all kinds of simulations. There's some, there's some canned simulations out there, canned, that you could use that, that would do that. So, when I saw that, it kind of sent off a little alarm bell in my head. And gosh, I hope I can get us back to where he was. Sorry about that. 74 runners. The asterisks mean that the classes had different numbers of students in them. So what's a fair winner? Oh, I know what he's doing Some now. kids may know how cross country works. Some kids may not. Some kids may have other mental models from other activities or sports or experience, or they may not. Small group project, crucial. At least two different answers. I should harken back to some of what we said understanding this. And then let's argue it out. And so we have a whole debate and each, each makes their presentation and we, oh, that's interesting, what do you think? Next day, we do a little jigsaw. Okay, count off in your group by four. The ones go discuss this. The twos go discuss this. The threes go discuss this. The fours go discuss this. Do that for about 10 minutes. Now go back to your group as an expert in that question. And now see if you want to modify your answer to yesterday's running problem. And for that matter, whether you want to modify your original answer to what is fair. Well, guys, it turns out, day three, that mathematicians have some tools that might be able to help us. On day three, we open the textbook, not day one. And now we're going to do some fairly straight ahead work out of the book on measures of central tendency, and we can go even beyond this to other measures if it seems appropriate, but we want to make sure that there's some control acquisition of these terms. But is this where the unit ends? Well, no. It has to culminate in meaning and transfer. I won't lose track this time.
you remember he was talking about the different mean, medium, mode th sort of thing, and he had a little thing about taking assessment. He sees quizzes, test, as ways to check classic formative, right? Ways to check for understanding close to the instruction, right smack in, right after we talked about it, read about it, did it in class, work some problems through. This is what he means by final assessment. I think sometimes we kind of, we kind of let, we don't get it, get it when he talks about assessment. We think he's still talking about test. No. And they should have come up with a different term, but I get it. Transfer assessment, maybe. I don't know. But that's what he's, when he says assessment earlier, what he's talking about there would be formative. And that formative is there specifically to check for the understanding of the terms that the kids were using to be able to look at the topic of FAIR. What do you think about this unit and how would you compare it to a typical math unit, be as specific as you can, small group conversation? First of all, how does the unit embody what we've been talking about? Two, what are your thoughts about it in, in a general sense? And three, do a little T-chart comparison. How does a typical unit go on this or any other topic compared to what's going on in this unit in terms of flow, prioritization, learning, teaching, just informally, no big deal, 10 minutes. Love the bell. Math teachers don't participate. Raise your hand if you hated high school math. Do you want to, do you want to jump out the building now? <laughs> now, now consider, now consider that this is a pretty not random sample. In the general population, the percentage is worse. This is serious. The way we do mathematics stinks. And yet we keep doing it, even in good schools. But we were actually just talking about that and saying, had we been taught math the way that people are starting to teach math now, we would have been so much better off. Because there Say was just, why. Because when I was learning math, it was all about, so just memorize the procedure. Here's some facts you need to know. And there, nobody ever really took the time to Ask me, so what does it really mean to add numbers? Or why, you know, in an equation with multiple atoms, why doesn't it matter what order you put them in? This is actually in the literature on transfer that the most common student response indicating failure of teaching for transfer is we didn't cover that one. We were, we were saying that what we liked about this is that it, it um, attracted also like kids who didn't think they were math kids. Of course, you've expanded the pool of interested parties. Mm -hmm. But also at the same time might have made kids who thought they were math kids a little bit uncomfortable because all of a sudden they have to explain and do, you know, bring in writing and, and explanation and spending. And that sometimes those non-math kids might also, you know, be doing well at this because, and then grouping them would be really great because they can see that they can succeed, like the non-math kids are succeeding there and the math kids are sort of challenging them. So it's not only expanding the pool of interested parties, but it's differentiatable by doing it this way. That's right. We thought this was a very, an obviously exciting way to teach a typical mathematical context, but I was wondering if it's actually a fair example to give in the larger context, because kids love talking about fairness and what's right and how things should be. But is this actually a fair way to to model problems in mathematics that might not have as as easy an applicability? It's your job to make it happen. That's what it means to have a design constraint. It's your design constraint to make it work for every example. It, it's easy to cherry pick. Ag agreed. But we can do it with one. We can do it with ten. And so let's start with the easier ones. It's also interesting to note when you look at the problem sets from Exeter, many of the problems are not as immediately accessible viscerally, but it's pretty interesting to watch kids struggle over pretty abstract problems 
because it involves real thinking and group work and what if and could it be otherwise. In other words, even the, you, you can see this happen with a good Socratic seminar. I may not be interested in the book we're reading. It may not have any immediacy to me, but even the challenge of making sense of it and bumping heads with other people who make a different sense of it is motivating. My comment, quadratics are real to that guy's comment. But I think that that's the design challenge. And, and that's why the last big idea is intellectual engagement. You have an obligation to intellectually engage people who aren't already interested in and good at math, which is the current failure. We're, it's like the Marines. We're looking for a few good men. You know, yeah. and, and it shows up over and over and over again in student evaluations, in the failures on national and international tests. We're not reaching anywhere near a number of people. So I'm saying that's what makes it a design problem. It's our design problem to expand the interest level and differentiate it more. And so we may not be able to do a problem exactly like this for every situation, but it's our obligation to try, or to say it the other way around. Intellectual engagement is a design consideration. Mm -hmm. It's not the student's problem. It's our role as designers. Good anecdote in that respect. I was on an internet uh, radio show with the guy who designed Rock Band, the game. And uh, it was fun, we were, we were talking about feedback. And I asked him about this. I said, how do you guys work on this subject of feedback? He said, we don't use the word feedback. We use the word incentivize. <laughs> how can we keep the player interested in every frame, at every level, throughout the entire game? Because if we don't, then they stop playing and they don't buy the game. What if we had that attitude as teachers? We have to incentivize every lesson, every activity, every day, every unit, every course. Most teachers just say, especially the older grades, tough one on you. You don't like it, too bad. My way or the highway. Man, I miss this guy. All right, let's see if we can um, get some closure here. And I know there's a lot to unpack on you. Can, let, let me just go back to that last example he gave about um, when he's talking to the game guy. There was a time there, no, oh, I don't know, six, seven, five years, no, six, seven, eight years ago, where everybody was saying, we ought to be doing gaming. Um, I can't remember if it was Prinsky. No, I can't remember the name of the person who was sort of the guru about gaming and education and you know and and we're seeing the same thing now with ar and vr you know it's like oh we should be putting like letting kids experience ar and vr i come from the grant wiggins school of why do we just let kids experience why aren't they doing where's the transfer here you know, playing a game or putting a bulky thing on your face is engaging for a little while. What it transfers out is, I know what it's like to live on the space station. No, you don't. You're not in zero gravity. It's, it's one of those things where when people do this kind of stuff, I just sit there and I go, no, no, you're, you're missing the point. What we should be doing is saying to kids, let me give you the tools. Let me show you how the tools work. Now go design a game. Let me give you the tools. Let me show you how the tools work. Go off and design a virtual reality or an augmentative reality. And then tell me what you would use it for. That's understanding by design. Okay. Now, if I, again, apologize. If the sound of this is bad, I apologize, just stop me and go and listen to it. But please listen to both of these videos. You now have got the philosophical base of understanding by design. And I just wish we all could have um, had the opportunity like I did to hear that man. Let me pop back out. Um, 
So I'm going to go up one more here. And let's look at what we're supposed to do. Remember, we're doing this, we're breaking this into three pieces, so don't freak out. Today, what we did is we took a look at the sort of foundational supports of understanding by design, that the goal, the goal then helps us illuminate what we're going to teach content and what the kids are going to do, demonstrations of understanding with transfer. And when we do that, what happens is we always have that goal clearly stated but kids know where they're going. Technology fits in everywhere in that. And I don't mean that is you have to have it everywhere. I mean, it fits anywhere. Let's use the right word. It fits anywhere within that model. When we look down here at what um, I'm asking you to do, I'm not going to sit here and read this article to you. He does a really good job, he and Jay, they do a really good job talking about acquisition, meaning making, and transfer. Now, let me show you, here's the, this link will take you to the article, putting understanding first. And what it does is it kind of talks about the different kinds of teaching. The real meat of this that will help you do it is here this live binders thing. When you go to that, and again, I apologize. I don't know why Blackboard all of a sudden doesn't, I always tell Blackboard my links should open in a new window, but some it does, some it doesn't, don't know why. But just click on that link, it'll get you there eventually. So here we are. The Understanding by Design Technology for Learning Connection. Hey, you ought to be looking at this. There's an awful lot in here that you could put into your final project that you're going to do. But right now though, let's look at this. So we're looking at it through the lens of teacher roles, acquisition, meaning making and transfer. So when you look at a teacher who is in acquisition, they do direct instruction to inform the learners to explicit instruction and targeted knowledge and skills differentiated as needed. Lecture, graphic organizers, demonstration or modeling, guided practice, feedback, corrections. There is not a pejorative associated with any of this. There's nothing that says, oh my God, you're an acquisition teacher. No. We all have to be acquisition teachers. I'm doing it right now. Making meaning to engage people in actively processing the information and guide their inquiry into problems, text, or simulations. Differentiating, differentiating the as needed through graphic organizers, concept, so on and so on. Transfer. To coach the learners to independently perform in increasingly complex situations, provide models and give ongoing feedback. If you think about what this is, this shouldn't be Miss Smith is an acquisition teacher Miss Jones is a making meaning teacher. And Miss Wakahana is a transfer teacher. We want everybody to be Mrs. Wakahana. No, we don't. What did TPAC say about this? What did Schulman say about this? He says that pedagogy should not be one and done. It should be, and you heard Grant use the term, slide. He said pedagogical slide. That's what good teachers do. So good teachers can be acquisition teachers, sliding into meaning making teacher, sliding into transfer teachers, back to acquisition teachers. It's a great, this is a great um, live binder. I like the live binders. They were really hot there for a while, and they've kinda, I'm glad this hasn't gone away. This is a really good tool. Um, and it's one of those tools that if you get into it, 
one of the things you can do is you can create your live binders. In other words, a place like this. And the thing that makes live binders what it is, is really simple. It's a very simple tool to use are these tabs across the top here. You can get that. And so uh, the part I'm trying to get to here is you can make your live binder hook into your Google Classroom. So you see, you've got these sub things up here about use sub tabs above to access uh, acquisition oriented web tools. And so you, you've got these different ideas about how that might work. Okay. And again, uh, uh, so Steve, do I, are you saying that in my final product, I should have something like a Jeopardy game? The idea of it, sure. The actual thing, no. This isn't a class about that. This is an, in, that's an independent study. You want to do with me? Yeah, that'd be that. What I'm looking for here is I want you to use your critical thinking and say, I'm going to put busy visitors in because it is such a good way for kids to not only read, see. Okay. All right. So that's where that is in the piece. Now, when you go back, oh God, <laughs> I hate it. What happened? And I have to jump back over to our modules, then I have to come back down to three. So what he's asking us to do here is to use a tool after we've read the article about putting understanding first, and then looking at the resources that live in the live binders, I want you to use a tool called Make Believe Comics. It's a great tool. You could use it for anything. And I need you to do it with at least three panels with dialogue. Now, why did he say at least three panels? Acquisition, meaning, making, transfer. Now, if you can figure out how to put all that together into one panel, you into that classic sort of uh, family circus kind of cartoon, comic, I mean, you go for it. Or that classic... Um, New Yorker cartoon. One of my favorite New Yorker cartoons is two guys sitting in a bar. And the one guy sitting there has kind of longish hair and kind of a longish beard. And he's wearing clothes that look like they came out of the 19th century. And the other guy is sitting there in a suit, you know, a tie is kind of undone. And the guy who is dressed like he's from the 19th century looks over at the other guy and he goes, I don't hear America singing anymore. I'll let you think on that. So, yeah, if you can do it in one panel and get them all in there, you go for it, kids. In other words, the two people in the and the whole point of this is you've got dialogue. So you've got people who are talking that when we look at it, we can see, okay, that's a that's a, a look at what acquisition might look like. And when we're doing acquisition and meaning making and meaning making and transfer, we're going to be using this tool right here called Make Beliefs Comics. Again, I don't know why. So you don't have to have an account. You don't have to do anything. All you're going to do is you're going to dive into it. Um, you notice how it does it in Spanish? So you can dive into it where it says create your own comic. So at this point, the default, the default is three. That's the other reason why I said three. If you want to go for one, one big one, you go right ahead. And all you do is you click on this minus sign. If you need more than three, click on the plus sign. You're going to name it. You can be as simple as that. The author's name. Now, how do you get started? Well, down here is where all the good stuff lives. Now, you can use these. These are kind of like <coughs> templates where they've already got the characters in place and they've already given them a, a speech bubble. Now, this is not like beyond. We're not going to actually hear speech or anything like that. We're just going to be writing. 
So I might want to start here with my characters. And I might want to think, by the way, it does take a little while to load. So don't freak out. You don't have just three characters. <laughs> um, start sliding over and they'll all fly in. Okay. So for direct act for acquisition, I might pick this guy. And I'm going to put him into my first panel by clicking on the panel and clicking on him. Then I'm going to want to put in some dialogue. So I'm going to go back to the beginning to where my dialogue choices are. Here they are. I can do talk balloons. I can do, you know, thought balloons. I could do a background in here, by the way, as well. Up to you. To move my character around, I just grab him, kind of slide him over a little bit. I'm going to put a talk balloon in there. And I think I'll use this one. And I can move it around. And now it's waiting for me to write something in here. I love Grammarly, how it catches all my mistakes. Oh, he'd say, come on. And I may need to move him down a little bit because he's kind of I may need to move him over a little bit. All right. So I'll let you figure out what I'm doing here. Which which one would you say this is that he's demonstrating? Acquisition, transfer, meaning it's going to be what I put down there, isn't it? So that's what you do. Okay. Now, when you're ready, you can save it if you if you create a little account. See what it's going to do. It says, you know, log in here to, to save it. Okay, fine. I don't want to do that. I don't need to do that. Boy, look how old this is. <laughs> so you're going to save it to disk. What we would call download. <laughs> anyway. And so I'm going to come in here and I'm going to call it Swan Comics. And then I'm going to download that image. It's right over there. And then for how I'm going to put this into where Steve wants it to go. So now we need to go back where our assignments are. Here we are. And I'm going to click on my assignment. And I'm going to go and write the submission. And I'm going to use a tool to be able to put that into here. Now, I could do it that way, or I could just copy and paste it in. All right? Okay, so that's how you're going to get it in here. And then, of course, you hit submit. Now, I wouldn't hit submit. I would hit save draft because before we're all said and done here, we're going to be using other things. And if you go ahead and submit, then you're done. So just save it as a, you know, as a draft and we'll be good to go. Boy, that's a lot of stuff, wouldn't it? By the way, you could also do that. You just click on your, comic and you go save image as or you could do copy image let's see if I do copy image it'll let me throw it in there nope let's see what happens when I attach a file 
I know that'll work. So I'm going to browse my computer. And I think I saved that to my desktop. I hope so. <laughs> oh, God. I don't want to sit here and have to hunt and hunt for everything. No. No, it didn't. All right. Let's go back to downloads. There it is. We'll click on it and we'll open it. And I will then submit. No, I'm going to save my draft. Whew. Almost messed up there, didn't I? It should be there. Let's try that again. It's either there or it's attached there. You know, I'm not freaking out because I know that it'll be there one way or another. So there's open. There it is. And I'm going to save the draft. Yeah, it's there. When I go in and look at it, it'll be there. And if it's not, you let me know. Okay. So that is the first of three that we'll be doing. Um, next time, I really would like you to take a look at Understanding, Understanding by Design, Chapter 4. That focuses on facets of understanding. The facets of understanding was something the guys came up with um, as a way of helping integrate technology into the whole understanding by design framework. Okay. So it was one of the things that when I got my training it was brand new at the time. And so a lot of people were freaking out because there just wasn't all that much technology. I mean, there was iMovie, there was things like that, you know, Apple had just come out with iMovie. And so everybody was doing these iMovie things that they would say was a way of doing demonstrations of facets of understanding. Yeah. But when you read that chapter, you'll see there's a lot more to it than that. Okay. If you want to hear another way uh, of looking or hearing about it, here's Jay. Uh, he's, I hate saying this, he's not as um, engaging as Grant is. And here is a Paltoons that we're going to learn how to make for the next one. As always, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, hey, Steve, what the heck, um, let me know. And I will see you next Tuesday. I will get this particular video uh, cooked tonight, and I'll have it ready for you tomorrow, if not tonight. Usually when I get home, what I do is um, I go ahead and, and let it cook. And then I go ahead and upload it into um, YouTube because when I do that, it comes over. Uh, the, the video quality is better. All righty. Uh, Mark, I'll let you have the last uh, word if you want it. I don't know if you're still here. Yeah, you're still here. Did we do okay? Do you think you've got an understanding of beginning an understanding of understanding by design? Boy, isn't that fun? You say that over and over again. All right. Thank you for being here. As always, if you need help, you know how to get a hold of me, 502-457-2937. Thank you, Mark, for being here. Thank you, the rest of you, for your text that you have sent me. And by the way, I've, I have started grading stuff that's showing up. Um, you don't have to do this after every week, but I appreciate those of you who do because it helps me sort of stay up and also gives me some feedback as to you know, are we getting right ideas across. Everything I've seen so far looks really, really good. See you all next Tuesday.